Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Philips webinar, Connect the Care, Remote Monitoring of Non-Invasive Ventilation in Hospital. I'm Dr. Weiling Zhang, Chief Medical Officer of Philips Connect Care Cluster. Thank you for joining us today from across the globe. Since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, Philips has hosted a series of webinars on COVID patient management and best practice sharing. This marks our 10th webinar. Our sincere appreciation goes to all the outstanding speakers for sharing their valuable knowledge and insights. Southeast Asian nations have managed to brave through the COVID-19 outbreaks in 2020. However, in 2021, we see many Asian countries hit hard by the highly contagious Delta variant and are now struggling with overwhelmed health services. There is an increased demand to improve hospital workflow efficiency, enhance patient safety, protect clinicians from infection, and improve non-invasive ventilation success. At Philips Connect Care, we strive to leverage and unite devices, informatics, data, and people across networks of care to enable our customers to deliver on the quadruple aim. Our goal is to provide the right data at the right time with the right context to make the right decisions. During the pandemic, we learned the importance of agility of delivery, staying flexible to meet the evolving customer and the patient care needs, and effective data sharing among various care units and the care settings. System interoperability continues to be an important focus area with data integration among medical devices and the workflow coordination among various care settings, translating data insights to increase the workflow efficiency. Virtual care, acute care telehealth, remote patient monitoring, effective patient flow, throughput management are all active areas of our focus. The end-to-end -end respiratory care is also a strategic priority with broader range of solutions from home oxygen, high-flow oxygen therapy to non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, BiPAP, all the way to invasive ventilation. We want to better serve you on various patient care needs. We also want to listen to you, the voice of our clinicians, to learn from your experience and gather your feedback. We're working on integrating monitoring and ventilator data more closely and connect them to the virtual care workflows. We care about our user experience and the ease of use, such as adding high flow options to the existing NIV products so clinicians can switch modes easily when the patient condition changes. You will hear some great innovative works from our outstanding panels today, chaired by Professor Nick Hart. Each speaker has done an amazing work in their hospitals and their communities to serve and improve patients' lives. Our deepest respect goes to all of them and to all of you in the audience. As we continue to collaborate and innovate in the face of COVID-19, I want to thank all of you for your fight against this ongoing pandemic. Everyone has played an important role, especially frontline care providers. Hats off to all of you. I hope you will find today's session helpful and provide new insights in better managing patients with COVID or other respiratory diseases. Thank you. Welcome to Philips 2021 webinar series, Connected Care Remote Monitoring of NIV in Hospital. I'm Nick Hart, I'm Professor of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital in London. The agenda for today is actually feeds on from what you've just heard, but we're going to hear about NIV remote monitoring systems for enhanced patient safety, and that's Dr Fahim Khan. We're also going to hear about NIV and high flow therapy, bedside monitoring and how we can be successful. That's Dr. Maxime Patou and non-invasive respiratory support for COVID patients. Um, and this is incredibly important. And that's from Professor Mohammed Basri and Assistant Professor Paterin Piron Panic. So this is a real international group of speakers. In fact, Dr. Fahim Khan is the senior consultant and head of the intensive care unit at 
Ng Teng Fong General Hospital in Singapore. Maxime Patou is a consultant at La Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital in Paris, France. We have Professor Mohamed Basri, who is the head of Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, and that's at the Islamic University in Malaysia. And then Associate Professor Patrin Pimron Panic is a consultant and assistant professor, and he's based at Tamasat University, which is in Thailand. I would like to send out a poll regarding your current practice of NIV monitoring. What available NIV monitoring systems are in your hospital? Well, what we see is bedside monitoring is 100%, which I think we all thought would be standard. Um, the interesting thing is we're obviously seeing an increasing uh, proportion of patients that are on telemonitoring systems, and then an even further increasing proportion of, of, of patients who are remotely monitored in terms of the home ventilation patients. And that's about one in five. So. We're going to move to the presentations, we're going to sit, we're going to listen, and we're going to learn. So I'd like to invite Dr. Fahim for his presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm Fahim, a senior intensivist at Anting Fung General Hospital in Singapore. I would like to share a concept we came up uh, because of COVID. As we all know, a lot of things have evolved our practices have changed over the last 18 months. We are not the same we were 18 months ago. Never been such a big event. Just made us think quite differently. So I want to share a concept and the project we managed to do to help us out uh, if things go big volume in number of patients we see. And can we do the same thing differently? So one of the concepts that came out was, can we use non-invasive ventilators in the wards, anywhere in the hospital, but same time, monitor the patients remotely and safely without compromising the patient care. Because we realized that during pandemic times, or even normal times, can we change certain things, how we monitor patients in the wards safely, especially in the use of non-invasive ventilators. So what I'm going to share now and explain how we came out and what we are doing and what's the data from pilot project and what we hope to do in the future. This is a few things, and especially looking at the old process and the new processes and what does the data shows us. Yes, we came up with a concept of using of non-invasive ventilators with the vitals in the wards and remote monitoring it. And what are we hoping to do from it? So when it came with the concept, we all know we use non-invasive ventilators. Most of the places in the world, we use either in high dependency unit, intensive care unit, or dedicated wards in the hospitals. The key is, yes, we put the patient non-invasive ventilators. What we wanted to know was, if something goes wrong with the patient non-invasive ventilator, how do we know on the staff on the ward? Generally, is by the noise it makes, the alarms it makes. God forbid we have loads of patients on this data, on these ventilators. How do we know which patient has a problem? And what else we need to know when we see this abnormal data? Do we need some more information? So as a clinician on the ground, so when somebody tells me something is wrong on the ventilator, I want to know is what's my blood pressure is like, what's my heart rate is like, what's my respiratory rate is like, what my oxygen is like, at the same time the data. So I make a clinical sense so I can give a better answer and advice to the person who's giving me the information. So we came with the concept, why can't we have two data combined and from two devices and send as soon as something is abnormal to a portable mobile device of an end user. So the end user, he or she can advise appropriately to say, should I go and do something or can do a telephonic advice and give the telephonic advice for troubleshooting it. That was the main concept we came out. Not only that, we can manage more number of patients, same time we manage even small number of patients, we manage more in an efficient way and safer way. So what we wanted to do was, in my current hospital, we use non-invasive ventilators in general, what anywhere in the hospital because we have a certain way of doing it uh, and we've got an infrastructure in place, we've got technology in place, but we want to make it more better, more fine-tuned and more safer. So what we came up with the same concept, data, vitals data, physiological and ventilator data combined together into one portable mobile device. We hope by doing the concept and doing this concept, we realize, can you pick the sicker patient faster and quicker? Ensure somebody chasing you up it's other way around, we're chasing the nurse on the ground to tell them something is wrong, improve our two-way communications. At the same time, 
without interfering with the whole hospital escalation protocol. So that was a thing we thought about. And so we, before we started, we, one was technology, one was a concept, and same time we wanted the teaching and training. We thought technology is useful, but same time we want people to know on the ground why we're doing it, how we're going to do it, benefit, no benefit, and what will the feedback from that. Because this was a pilot project and this was more of a trying to get feedback on the ground itself. It's easy once in a while become ideas and concepts, but you don't get the feedback. So what we started doing was start doing because of the pandemic, we started doing as much as possible face to face, but same time a lot of interaction via the phone, Zoom calls, targeted classroom missions. Uh, and we wanted to see what is the exact problem we have when we use non-invasive ventilators in the world. How confident are the people on the ground when they machine is put on the patient and how confident they are. Yes, sometimes we do come with the policies. Please do it on dedicated nurse, dedicated wards, only certain group of people can handle it. But question come, can we generalize it up? Because we're talking about pandemic sometimes and we can't have all the expert staff, expert wards, specialist wards to have only that dedicated areas because the volume is huge and big. So we wanted to get the feedback itself. Same time trying to build up the technology, we are also getting the feedback. So what we realized during pandemic also, because these ideas and concept came up around 18 months ago, not only by using technology, can I reduce the amount of PPE materials? Because that was the most important things. Because people were looking at it, how can I control, how do not I waste it up? And not only wasting it, if the time it takes, if it's something to be troubleshoot, you need to run fast and quick. How much time does it take to wear a PPE? Can we also wait for some things to go really bad or we prepare ourselves in hand before? If we have a first wave or second wave or third wave, can we learn from those things and make sure that when the next wave hits, we are well prepared better than the previous ones? Can we improve our ventilating certain group of patients, especially non-invasive ventilators in the general world with the confidence to say, I'll give you the same quality of care, same level of safety as you can be in high dependency wards. That's what happens in my hospital is a workflow before we initiated this pilot project. Patient on NIV machines, the ward nurse is involved in taking care of the patient, one is to six, one of them is on NIV. If she finds something wrong, especially when you hear a noise on the machine, that something is wrong, she goes and have a look. In my hospital, we've got respiratory therapist, similar concept to America. She picks up a phone and calls the respiratory therapist. Unless a clinical deterioration, which is going fast, then she calls up a doctor. As much communication can take place over the phone, the RT, the spirit therapist, and the nurse, they try to troubleshoot, but we do know it can be time consuming, cumbersome, especially wearing your PPE, and sometimes you miss the information. And most of the time we realize that RT ends up going to the ward to see the, what's happening, and so they can give appropriate advice. And depending on that, escalation takes place. So we thought with the escalation and the, with the concept, using technology and combining two data, vitals as well as NIV data. Now we're creating algorithm where the preset triggered alarm. For example, I've set a trigger saying that, please inform me when my size is 90%. Please inform me when my tidal volume is low. Please inform me when something is disconnected. So we had a determined six predetermined alarms on the ventilators. So what happens is like, as soon as alarm makes a noise, the data plus the physiological data, which may heart rate, respiratory rate and O2 set, which are continuous monitoring attached to the patient, both the data combined goes automatically in the form of an email convert into SMS message and to a portable mobile device of a RT who's monitoring remotely. Now there are two data on the hand. If, now what happens instead of the nurse calling the RT to say something is wrong, now we find the RT calling the nurse to say something is wrong with your patient. Are you aware of it or not? And I have this data my, on my phone. I can see the screenshot of the whole screen of the ventilator as well as my vitals data. So they can give appropriate advice. There's no more wasting of your time. What's my tidal volume? What's my O2 size? What's my respiratory rate? The whole live data in front of the RT who can communicate with the general ward nurse on the ground, alert them if they're not aware of it and advise them appropriately. And now we realize that by doing this, the number of times the RT going to the ward was have been reduced more than 50% of it because they had the right data, right information, no more wasting your time on the phone calls also. So that was where our concept came up with. So we changed the whole paradigm. The nurse calling the RT, we changed the paradigm not the RT calling the nurse, reducing the workload on the nurse, as well as the life and continuous and dynamic data. Then we, we always comes, it's like, okay, your views of NIV, you're doing this concept, 
how many NIV patients do we have in my hospital? We wanted to look into it and what happens and what kind of NIVs we have in my hospital and how do we use it? Where do they get started from? So when we look at our own data, we realize now is non-invasive ventilators can be started in intensive care unit because they're quite sick, step down, they got better, no bit of ceiling of care, or they can okay with NIV for long term, they go to the ward. Sometimes in the ED itself. If you see the column of started themselves in the general ward the first time, when you look at data, you realize we are having an increasing in number of patient obstructive sleep apnea from the community coming some other medical problems also who needs NIV in the ward because they're on NIV at home. So there's a big chunk of these patients also coming to the hospitals. Yes, we use NIV machines at home for OSA, but when you come to healthcare, we are a bit fidgety because we're not comfortable some of times, not all of us, but some of us. So we look at all those concepts and ideas and we see what my workload is, where they get initiated, what's the indication for it, what happens to them. Well, you see, as you see, my average in my hospital of use of NIV is around 40 to 45 in a month. So when you look at the concept, so the concept was, if you see on the right-hand side is my Philips Trilogy machine. Left-hand side is my Philips MX400. So what we wanted, what was trying to explain in the last few minutes was the data from these two screens goes something is wrong, automatically fast and quick onto my portable device carried by respiratory therapist, which can be anywhere in the hospital. So that's what our concept was, is data from these two monitors, NIV as well as the vitals, flow straight into me, wherever I am in the hospital, so I can troubleshoot, I can ask and do things. The key thing is, I do not have to look at the data on my phone all the time. It was say something abnormal, a message comes to me. So that was the key thing, basically. So that's the screenshot where the way that technology works is Philips and NIV data from here flows into MX400. You can see a small screenshot on the left side of the screen. We take the vitals data, and from here it goes into the Philips IB server. From the Philips IB server, convert it into an email. From the email, middleware converts into SMS format. From there, it goes to the device anywhere we carry it. The key thing drawbacks we realize when we do those things is we have to be careful of PDPA, Patient Data Protection Act. We have to be careful, we can't use internet, we have to use internet in the hospital. So all the security stuff, we all had been compliant. I had to use only OS gadgets, not Androids, because that was a worry about hacking. Lose the screenshot. You can get similar data screenshot on your mobile device. The live, in the form of central monitor, or convert into SMS message. That was a pilot project, what we had in mind. So what we do pilot project, we analyze over a period of six weeks to see my concept, does it work? Is it useful? And how many patients do I have? And how many alarms it takes place for X number of patients? Because you always worry about false positive, true positive, false negative. So what we realized was, let's fine tune all those things. This was a project in evolution. Yes, there's always fine tuning take place and we are going to fine tune more and more as we go along. The key thing of any project is, go with open mind and fine tuning and trying to make it better. So my um, analyze on 21 patients, we put on trilogy machine in of six weeks time. We have around 95 document unconscious alarms and the actions taken by the nurse and the RT. The question comes now as a clinical person, what kind of patients and what kind of status are they on? Is a full code patient, that means for full care or partial code which is American terminology for ceiling of care, allowing natural death, or limitation of care. If you see everything is in blue on your right, is the patients who were on full code. And for example, number eight, guillain barre syndrome. This was a step down. The patient was in IC for four to five months, was ventilator dependent. Why a tracheostomy? We could monitor it on the wards. And when you look at one was diagnosis and what kind of alarms it gives you, what is the most common alarms we have? The most common alarms we found was low pressure and patient disconnection because patient disconnect. So one of the things we learned was even though somebody's monitoring from the remote, there is no communication between the nurse and the RT saying that, oh, I'm going to give him a breakfast. I'm going to give him a sips of water. We realized that, that we need more fine tuning. It's interesting you need to know. We can have technology unless we have communication sometimes saying that, okay, please ignore alarm for bed five, ward eight, because I'm going to disconnect the mask because I'm going to give him sips of water. If you don't communicate with the RT, 
and say that, then you are, they automatically find that you have a lot of alarms which shows that we call a patient disconnection. Interesting thing we wanted was sicker patients. Can I find a patient who's more hypoxic? Or is this a power disconnection completely? The key thing we wanted was we do not want to harm the patient. We want to make sure give 100% safety. And we pick any patient potentially early on because of live dynamic data. And we found at least seven episodes of seven different patients, we could pick it up where early on because they're because of hypoxia on average of one case per week. That is a key, key thing. And not only that, we could pick up certain things earlier on the mask was not right because if initially when we put somebody on NIV, the mask is fit is good. But after an hour, two, three hours, because the way things are, you find good. it's loose. You're not getting the exact what we want to deliver to the patient. And that's what, one of the key things you realize. After some time, it becomes too loose or it comes off or it's a circuit disconnection. So we have picked up certain things which could have prevented further deterioration of the patient. The key thing was picking hypoxic patients. We could pick them earlier on and faster and quicker. So what we gather from our experience of using the concept where I use an IV, my vitals combined together on a patient in a ward. And from there, anything abnormal, a message goes off automatically alerting somebody asking for help. Instead of waiting for somebody to look at it and, and communication take place, somebody remotely monitoring it with the person looking at the patient on the ground. It can be done. It was a multidisciplinary involvement. We involved biomedical engineering in IT technology in Philips, Singapore, and make clinical stuff. And it's a, it's a process in evolution. The key thing we learned was we can do as many NIV ventilators in the ward with the vital data and we can do it safely without causing any compromise in the patient care. Yes, we talk about, oh, somebody who's monitoring it has their workload goes up. But actually when you realize it and look at time spent in the old workflow where they have to pick up, a, they get a phone call from the nurse, they had to and fro questions comes and goes, then most of the time they end up walking it. And we realized actually there was a better workflow, it was more useful and more efficient Yes, PPE, less time spent on the phone calls because most of the data is on your phone. And there's better communication between the nurses and the artists and nurses know what are less stress when a patient is on NIV because they also know as a backup system, somebody is monitoring it there. We're not only stopping there. We are continuing, we are analyzing. We've got another 50 patients. We have analyzed after 21 patients. We are finding the whole process and how do we improve it? We are continuing our training sessions. Yes, we can bring a technology, but same time we need to make sure that people on the ground knows what technology we're using, how we are using it, how we are changing the workflows. What we talk about data logging. What we mean data logging is yes, there is a noise made, is alarm made, SMS made. But what we want now moving forward is to make it more efficient. Is as soon as I get a message on my phone, I read it, I acknowledge it. And the acknowledgement goes automatically back into my electronic medical record, saying that I, Dr. Fahim, have seen the data, I've acknowledged it, it and goes automatically to the on the data flow sheets. As well as the message goes back to the nurse in charge of the particular patient on NIV, saying that there's abnormal alarm, somebody has seen it, acknowledged it, and this action plan is also be, will be created where somebody who's acknowledging the alarms can also send a message before they come and see the patient themselves. And also improves in two-way communication. We want to send a two-way, bi-directional way of communicating. Now, RT communicates to the nurse. When RT gets something abnormal, they can send a message straight away to the nurse on the ground saying that I'm coming or do X, Y, Z, or please look into this or call a doctor. We're going to make it everything into a mobile, into an app format where you can have acknowledgement of data, data flows in, data flows back into the electronic medical record and all the action taking place happens. Thank you. I wouldn't have managed to do this project without my team members whom I want to acknowledge and thank them, especially my colleague project, Dr. Nikhil Gautam, my colleagues from respiratory therapists, biomedical engineering, IT department, and not the least, Philip Singapore, who helped us and agreed with my silly ideas of how to do things of tele and IV monitoring in the hospital during the pandemic time. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Fahim Khan for his wonderful talk. And in fact, it resonates significantly in how 
a number of us have approached the issues that we had with the pandemic with um, a significant number of patients to manage. I think what I would like to ask, what do you think um, the must have monitoring is for our patients? It depends on what conditions we are, or indication for putting patients in the ward on NIV. If you ask me the must from our experience is my respiratory rate, because we know it's the most sensitive parameter. Uh, and we know it's manually calculated wrongly across the world. So I preferably I would like a respiratory rate with a, uh, with a sensor, especially biosensor, wireless, and second thing I need oxygen saturations. The key two things which I would require to have uh, with the patients on NIV. I agree with you, and, and, and in fact, I put it in the chat as well, the must-have monitoring is going to depend, I think, around the cause of the respiratory failure, the acuity of the patient, the dependency and the trajectory of the acute condition, because there are some conditions that I would have um, a lot more concern about and perhaps more monitoring, even moving to invasive type monitoring for some patients uh, and less so for others. So I think it's really important to put it into the context of the situation you're in, the type of patient you have, um, and also the staff you have around you. Very much like to thank you for that. Um, we have to move on to the next speaker, Dr. Maxime Patou and his presentation. Good day to you all. I'm Maxime Patou, a respiratory physician working in Paris in France, and I'm going to talk to you today on NIV, high flow therapy, bedside monitoring and success. And I think it is a key uh, problem to address for patients with COVID-19. So first, to start, I would like to remember last year when we had the first wave of the pandemic, and you can see on the left side of the slide uh, where I used to work for a while in Mulhouse, where we had the peak of the pandemic in the first wave in France, where we had lots of patients. And as you can see, we had the army that came to set up a military uh, hospital. But can you do medicine when people uh, at the entry of the hospital have guns. It, it, it's slightly confusing, but we managed to do it. And on the right side of the panel, you can see that we had to develop our skills to create new way to deliver oxygen. As you can see on the slide, you have uh, some oxygen, so up to 50 liters that are connected together to the oxygen uh, port of the hospital so that we can provide up to 50 liters of uh, permitted of oxygen for the patient in need. So we had very sick patients, and as you can see, they were not where they are supposed to be in an ICU. So we had to develop some monitoring tool in order to make sure that our patients were safe. Yes, it was a warlike situation, yet we had to deliver the best care for our patient. We had to provide them with a good monitoring so that they can be safe. The other reason why we had to monitor the patient is that patient could deteriorate quite rapidly. That's why they are usually in the ICU. And we need to have monitoring to see early signs of deterioration. But the other reason why we would need the monitoring is the fact that we also need to detect when the patient feels better so that we can step down the oxygen, stop the CPAP or the high flow, and step the patient down to a traditional world to free some pace for the other patients. So these are the aims of the monitoring. So what are the particularity that we have in monitoring for the COVID pandemic? First of all, patients were in isolation because we were not fully aware of the virus. And initially during the first wave of the pandemic, we had a lack of uh, personal protection equipment for the staff. So people were in their rooms and we tried to avoid going in and going out the bedrooms. We drilled holes inside the doors of the usual world so that we can have a look through the window to the patients. The other thing that was very particular with the COVID pandemic was the happy hypoxemia phenomenon. And even if there is no clear evidence on why it occurred, it was real. And you can see on the right side of the panel, one of the patients, as you can see, he's on high flow therapy. His oxygen saturation is around 89%. Yet he was breathing very calmly. He was texting his friends. And the day after, the patient died. So we really need 
to uh, be mindful of that and have dedicated intermediate care units. And in this unit, we need to have a patient that is safe, but with not the same equipment and not the same staff that we usually have in the ICU. And we need to be able to assess these two other goals, treatment failure detection and early detection of, a, of improvements. So you may ask, are the patients safe in the intermediate care units? And uh, the first thing that we need to speak about is that the fact that there was no other solution. As you can see here in the map from a review paper that has been published recently, in all Europe, and it's probably the same in the other part of the world, but that was during the first wave of the pandemic, you can see that the number of ICU beds increased dramatically by more than 100% in all the country. And for example, in Switzerland, they had a 400 increase in the number of respiratory HTU capacity. So it was a problem. So there was no other way for us to cope with the pandemic. Um, we had to do these intermediate care units. So where are the patients safe? So I, I think that now we can have some data saying that it was the case. So you uh, have here the example of a small cohort that has been published in the European Respiratory Journal a year ago. And it was the first report of an intermediate care unit. It was in the past, before the pandemic, a respiratory ward, but they transformed the unit and equipped all the rooms and all the patient with continuous set monitoring. And they have received at the time of this publication, 27 patients with SARS-CoV-2 proven infection. And these patients were given high flow oxygen therapy. All of them had a mean age of 77 years and a PF ratio of 120 at seven days of symptoms onset. The high flow oxygen therapy was delivered at 55 liters per minute with a FiO2 of 55%. So as you can see, it was a true population that we are used to see in the ICU outside of the pandemic. And as you can see on the graph here, even if seven patients were intubated and four patients deceased, most of the patients had a favorable outcome. And I think that these 20 patients should have been in ICU, but because of the lack of bed, they were admitted in an intermediate care unit and were managed safely. So I think it is a really good point. Once again, it's another uh, example of what have been done with the intermediate care units. This time it's in Spain that uh, the study has been done. It's once again a core study. But what is interesting in that study is that the author have differentiated the step down process. So when patients were previously in the ICU, feeling better, where we went to a tracheostomy and then step down to this intermediate care unit and a step up process where the patient were unwell and were then transferred to this respiratory intermediate care unit before being transferred to the ICU or unfortunately uh, before dying. So 65 uh, patients were stepped down. So I think it's very important to realize that most of these patients should have been in the ICU or would have had a prolonged stay in the ICU. And the fact that they were stepped down freed some bed for the other patients. Most of the patients were tracheostomized. And as you can see, the mortality is higher when you step up to intermediate care units, but that is because you are more at an acute phase, you are more sick than the patients that are in the recovery process. So respiratory intermediate care unit help to shorten the ICU stay and free some beds for more sick patients. So here this time we are discussing once again intermediate care units, but this time in Italy, another part of Europe, and the patients that were included in this large cohort were all received CPAP, NIV, or high flow therapy with proven uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So at the time of the study, 9,000 of patients were admitted in the ICU in Italy for this disease. And 10% of them, so 900%, were treated outside the ICU, which means that by doing that, the Italians have increased their ICU capacity by more than 
just by changing the way that they were working. Most of the patients in that study received CPAP, 10% received NIV, and as it was in the early phase of the pandemic, very few received high flow therapy. And as you can see on the slide, the survival was worse in patients with the most severe disease. But what is interesting is that the mortality rate was 37%. So you may think that a 37 rate of NIV failure is quite high. Yet, you have to remember that this is an unselected population. So when we look at randomized controlled trial, and this is one example that is once again has been published, uh, performed in Italy, and you can see that it was an ICU study. So people included in that trial were admitted in the ICU, so a proper ICU, not an intermediate care unit, and they include around 100 of patients. And the randomized patient to receive either high flow nasal oxygen or helmet non invasive ventilation. The main judgment criteria of this study was the number of days free of ventilation, and the authors failed to show any difference between the two groups because the number of days was 18 in one group and 20 in the other. But what was interesting is that in the study, they have a higher rate of intubation with high flow therapy. These data are counterbalanced by the recovery study that has been published as a preprint, but not as a peer-reviewed paper, comparing the benefit of high flow and CPAP. So uh, we need to interpret this data uh, cautiously. But what I think is very important is to see that in a selected population in the ICU with a similar P2F ratio, the NIV failure rate was similar as the one that you can see in intermediate care unit because it was around 30%. So probably it's not very harmful to be admitted in the respiratory intermediate care unit if you have a proper organization to take care of the patients. This study is quite interesting because it has been conducted in the UK. And as you may know, quite a significant proportion of the patients that were admitted in these intermediate care units were patients for whom the ceiling of care was NIV or CPAP. And it's interesting to have a population, a cohort, that has been selected based on those criteria. So this study has been conducted in several centers in the UK, and they have only included patients that had oxygen or CPAP as a ceiling of care. Almost 500 patients were included in that trial. And as you can see, it was a very frail population, so the mortality rate is quite high. It's 75%. The patients included in that trial were very severe. All of them had a FiO2 above 40%. But what is interesting to see is that there was no difference between high flow therapy, oxygen therapy, or CPAP. And probably CPAP was better tolerated than CPAP because it's easier to speak with, it's less cumbersome, it applies less pressure on the face. And this may be illustrated by the fact that 50% of the patients that were in this study stopped the CPAP treatment because of uh, some side effects. So if you have a patient that has a ceiling of care, yes, you can admit him or her to a respiratory intermediate care units, but probably you need to also adjust the type of monitoring that you want to give to the patient because it won't change the outcome. And in that scenario, you should prefer the less invasive treatment option, in my opinion. Initially, we were very scared about the virus, and obviously we are still are. And we know that from previous data that has been published in the pre-COVID time, there was some risk of aerosolization with the use of non-invasive ventilation or high flow therapy. And that is one of the reasons why in the first score that I've shown you in Italy, a very few patients had high flow therapy. So because we need to take care of the patient. Obviously, if you want the patient safe, you want to have the staff that is safe and you don't want them to have COVID. So we were cautious and I think we were right to be cautious. So we set up quite a few adjustments to the way that we deliver the treatment. As you can see on the slides in the French Respiratory Committee, we recommended, like in other countries, the use of bacterial filters when we were using CPAP or ventilators. But to do so, and also because we had to use home ventilators, we had to make some changes on the NIV or the CPAP circuits. And I think it's important to have in mind that if we change something on the ventilator, 
we will change the way that the treatment is delivered and that may have some consequences. In this trial that we've conducted, it's a bench trial, we have assessed the impact of the insertion of bacterial filters on CPAP and NIV, and we also assess different kind of NIV circuit setup. And what we have shown in this bench test was the fact that when you had a bacterial filter on your NIV circuit, you decreased the tidal volume that was delivered to the patient, you decreased the pressure that was delivered to the patient, and you also increased the work of breathing for the patient. And in some setups, in some circuit setups, we've shown that in NIV, we increase the number of patient ventilator asynchronies. And we know that for acute respiratory failure, if you had a lot of asynchronies, you have worse outcome. So we need to be careful when we make changes. And one of the things that we had to do also because of the COVID is the fact that we had to use home ventilators to deliver CPAP. And because you would use home ventilators, you don't have an oxygen blender on the ventilator, so you need to add some oxygen. And this bench study highlighted the fact that when you use a CPAP at 10 centimeters of water with a circuit that doesn't have any leak, if you put 15 liters of oxygen on your CPAP or on your ventilator, you can only achieve a 65% FiO2, so you are not at 100%. To do so, you need to have 30 liters of oxygen in your uh, circuit. And it's even worse when you have leaks on the circuit, if, especially if it's uh, intentional leaks. So when we use equipment that is not designed for that purpose, we need to be careful and adjust the way that we deliver the things. But we also need to make sure that our fears are true. And I think this study is very important. It has just been published in the, in the Thorax Journal, and they have done a very important study when they have taken sample on the patient nose, and then they have sampled the air. And as you can see on the slide, if you have 73% of the sample that were positive in the uh, nasopharyngeal space, less than 17% were positive when the patient were breathing, were coughing, or we're using CPAP or high flow. So I think there is a very low risk of aerosol contamination when you are using this kind of treatment in patients with COVID. So we should give the best care to our patients. Then we need to, obviously, I think the patients are safe in the intermediate care units. I'm, I'm convinced by that, but we need to be very careful because it's not the usual setting. So a little bit like Nostradamus, we need to be able to predict the future. And predicting the future is always challenging. So we need to have data to identify the patient that at higher risk than the others. From this large cohort of 11,000 of patients, we can identify that patient with comorbidities such as chronic respiratory disease, cardiac disease, immunosuppression, diabetes or cancer, uh, patients that are obese or less advanced in age are more likely to die from the COVID. So we should give them extra attention. From the same cohort that we discussed earlier from Italy that has included 600 patients, we have identified that during the course of the evolution of the COVID, if the patient has a bacterial infection, it is one of the main criteria for developing a respirator for an adverse a negative outcome. And the PF ratio is obviously also a prognostic factor. But I think when you use this kind of data, it's only the patient admission. And what we want to know is the fact that when we give a treatment, does it increase the likelihood of the patient to feel better or not? So in this trial, they have assessed 150 patients, and the CPAP was delivered around 11 centimeters of water. And what they have seen is that the failure rate was 45%. The, the failure rate was defined as the death or uh, invasive ventilation. But I think what is most important in that trial is the fact that they have shown that if you have a response, if you increase your PF ratio by more than 30% following the initiation of CPAP, you have a better outcome than if you don't. So monitoring the effect that the treatment has on the patient, I think is very important. And that can also be seen using more complicated technology. Electrical impedance tomography is a non-invasive technique, and the higher the impedance is, the higher the lung recruitment is. And in this trial, they have stepped down the pressure from 12 to 6, and they have shown that if there was no change or little change, 
in the lung recruitment, failure of CPAP was more likely to, to occur, which means that if the lungs are not recruitable during a CPAP, you are more likely to fail. For high flow oxygen therapy, the ROX index is very interesting. The ROX index is a saturation of oxygen divided by the FiO2 divided by the respiratory rate. It can be assessed at one hour, six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And as you can see in this cohort of 85 patients, you can identify patients that are likely to fail using this tool. What we have seen here means that when we do admit a patient in a respiratory intensive care, uh, intermediate care, you need to have a close monitoring. And that is something that we have done with the help of Felix during the first wave of the pandemic using the Trilogy Evo ventilator to build a like ICU continuous monitoring with alarm and so on. So to conclude, I think that a successful monitoring of NIV and high flow therapy relies on simple parameters, the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturation, the improvement that you give to the patient with CPAP or with prone positioning. You need to monitor the patient continuously. And for all the patients that are admitted in uh, one of these intermediate care units, you need to have an escalation plan for each patient to know what is the ceiling of care for this particular patient. So thank you for your patience. And I hope that you have some questions that we may address. Thank you all. Maxine, that was fabulous as ever. And it, it's welcome to hear you talk about some very important issues around the use of non-invasive respiratory support. And again, like all these parts of what, when we're looking at clinical trials and clinical physiology, um, there's going to be controversial areas which will lead to greater discussion. I think that's our experience as well. I'd like to move on now uh, and invite Professor Mohammed Basri um, to talk. Over to you. My topic is on non-invasive ventilation in COVID-19 pneumonia. In Malaysia, the number of COVID-19 cases reduced significantly with the increased rates of vaccination. This is also reflected with the number of ICU admissions, which declined to more than 60% as shown in the second graph. Our teaching hospital with a 10-bedded general adult ICU is not the COVID-19 center. However, later we started treating patients with cases that were admitted to our hospital. We have ICU registry, which we started in November 2020. Our data recorded about 550 patients over the past uh, one year. From our ICU registry, about 77 patients were admitted with suspected COVID-19 and about 40 patients with confirmed COVID-19 pneumonia. Overall length of stay is 6.7 days. And as you, when we look uh, closely from our registry data mortality, about 7.7%, about 44 patients receive respiratory support. Out of confirmed cases, 16 patients receive mechanical ventilation and 16 receive high flow as a cannula and the 12 receive non-invasive ventilation. I would like to demonstrate two cases who receive NIV in our ICU. The first case is a 42-year-old lady and she's obese with past history of bronchial asthma on MDI, bordesonide and sabotamol. Uh, she had a category 5A COVID-19 pneumonia. Trial of high flow nasal cannula failed and then changed to NIV. She received IV metal prednisolone at 2 mg per kilogram for five days, followed by IV dexamethasone. She was given the tablet baricitinib as well. She improved and discharged from our ICU about 13 days later. She was not comfortable to self-prone, so we asked her to sit in the tinker or Rodin's position. Uh, Rodin's position where we ask patients to lie forward with her chest on the flat surface while sitting. And this position can be assumed when breathing through non-invasive ventilation. She improved significantly as shown in the PF ratio in this table. And this chest X-ray that demonstrate the COVID-19 ground glass appearance changes bilaterally. So the second case is a 57-year-old man, a past history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and a minor stroke. He had COVID-19 pneumonia, category 5A, 
it was admitted to our ICU and uh, put on high flow nasal cannula, which failed and then converted to NIV. This is his X ray and images of his CT scan. CTPA done uh, showed no evidence of PE. However, there is worsening COVID 19 changes and features of organizing pneumonia. There is also associated subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomedastinum. He was uh, very cooperative, as shown here, and able to self prone. His PF ratio improved remarkably, as shown in this table. He was discharged from the ICU 14 days later. How do we monitor these patients in our ICU while receiving NIV? We use clinical criteria and also guided by HACO score. The components of HACO score are heart rate, pH, GCS, PF ratio, and the respiratory rate. NIV provides additional inspiratory support and is primarily indicated when hypoxemia is associated with modest worsening of ventilation requirements and the need to increase alveolar ventilation or to reduce the workload of the respiratory muscle. A high inspiratory effort represents not only as indication to start NIV, but also to detect NIV failure and the need to escalate treatment to invasive ventilation. So there's no reason not to exploit NIV, provided that there are no indications for imminent intubation. The patient is closely monitored and precautions made to avoid intubation delay and to avoid virus transmission. So the resulting reduction in invasive mechanical ventilation and ICU burden could be life-saving. An algorithm for the safe use and efficient application of high flow nasal cannula and NIV is provided as shown in this slide. So the main drawback of NIV is intubation delay, cautious selection of patients with severe hypoxemia due to COVID-19 disease, close monitoring and appropriate employment and titration of NIV can increase the rate of success and eliminate the risk of intubation delay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think that resonates hugely with us all in terms of patients with the COVID 19 pneumonitis uh, and these patients receiving non invasive respiratory support, um, we now think about timely intubation and not delay intubation because of the risk of self induced lung injury. Um, it leads me on now to hear from Dr. Paterin Pir Piram Panic from Thailand. Over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Paterin. I come from Thammasa University Hospital in Thailand. Thank you for the opportunity to share the experience from my country. Today, I'm going to be talking about non-invasive respiratory support for COVID patients. Let me give you an overview on the COVID situation in Thailand. As you can see from the graph here, Thailand did not experience many COVID cases last year. However, there was a surge in April of this year and peaked in mid-August. The number of deaths peaked around two weeks after that, which is the end of August. On average, we have a mortality rate of approximately 1.1%. So let me introduce our hospital. Thomas University Hospital is a 700-bed teaching hospital located north of Bangkok. Early on in the pandemic in Thailand, we tended to intubate patients early due to the concern over droplets. After more information, we used high-flow nasal cannula to support hypoxemic patients. NIV were used more after the search in April. We found that NIV can help prevent intubation in some patients. In our hospital, we prefer using a helmet rather than a face mask. The helmet was first demonstrated in our hospital in January. And this is how we adopt the helmet. After being demonstrated in January, we asked our team to try it, to fail it. This is me trying it on. This is my fellow and ICU nurse and try it in a prone position as well. And in April, the helmet were donated to our hospital. So we got a chance to use them. And our first case was in mid-May. My fellow and I put it on the patient. And this is our NIV data from April to September this year. Our success rate was around 60%. About three quarters of the cases were helmets. However, around the peak of new cases, it became too overwhelming. The severe COVID cases were more than ICU capacity. 
So more patients came to the hospital late and were very sick and needed intubation. Let me share two NAV success cases. The first case, a 45-year-old man who presented with fever, cough, and fatigue. This is a chest X-ray on day five of illness, and he required oxygen supplementation on day 11. Despite antiviral drug and dexamethasone being given, work of breathing was increased, and immobidiastinum was developed. He was then transferred to our hospital. As you can see from the shared X-ray on the right, there is a telectasis at the right lower lobe. Metropenicillin was started. And helmet NIV was used to support respiration. With pressure support of five and PEEP of five, his respiratory rate decreased. On top of that, awakening prone position while on the helmet was used. To allow the patient to eat by himself, we used high flow nasal cannula for a short time, but his respiratory rate increased from 20 to 30. So this tells us that NAV is beneficial and his atelectasis improved on the next day. In total, he was on the helmet for six days. His condition had improved and he could be discharged without oxygen supplementation. Now let me show you another example. This is a 50-year-old woman with BMI of 50. First diagnosed with diabetes and hemoglobin A1C of 11. Her next circumference was actually larger than the helmet size that we had. So we put her on the uh, nasal mask instead. Her condition deteriorated on day seven. So anti-inflammatory drug was given. Nasal mask and AV was used to buy time for the drug to action. Pressure support was increased from 10 to 15, which reduced her respiratory rate from 32 to 17. And because she was not able to put in a prone position, so she just lay on her side. In total, she was on the mask for five days. Her condition had improved and she could be discharged without oxygen supplementation as well. So in conclusion, NIV might reduce invasive mechanical ventilation and mortality. Our NIV failure rate was about 40%. However, NIV requires extensive monitoring to make sure that intubation is not delayed. So team experience is crucial. And that's all for my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you. Patrick, that's really helpful. Again, I think the messages are coming through really clear. We need to monitor our patients. We need to monitor them in terms of clinically, but also in terms of technology. But also we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the right patient at the right time, and that we're not delaying treatments that we know will improve their outcome. And I think that's a real key element of what we've heard. So thank you for that. So I think we'll go straight on to the Q&A session. And it's great to have all of the speakers here so we can discuss some key elements that have come out during their presentations. Um, and I'd like to approach them all in turn. And it will be great to get their understanding. Um, so I'm going to go for the first question, which uh, the and we've touched on this, but what's the minimum requirements for, for monitoring parameters uh, for both hypercapnic and hypoxic respiratory mm -hmm. failure? And I wonder if we can start with Fahim. At present, we do not have a clear cutoff number to decide which patient should go based on particular numbers. It's based on clinical judgment by the consultant responsible for the patient care. So example, in my unit, we, all the referrals goes to ICU consultant 24 seven. He or she decides basically his patient is a step down or is a ceiling of care, we only NIV is a ceiling of care. Where as you have uh, earlier highlighted it, uh, it depends uh, on clinical judgment call by the consultant intensivist in, in my unit. Thanks Fahim. Um, Maxime, in France, what's, what's the minimum requirements for the hypercapnic and hypoxic respiratory failure patient? I think the respiratory rate, the saturation, uh, I mean, are the very minimal thing that you need to monitor, uh, even if it's in the pandemic, even if it's in intermediate care, because we know that it's a problem. Then I think if, we, if you have the patient on non-invasive ventilation, what is particularly helpful is if you have uh, remote monitoring or at least some transmission of the data from the ventilator, because that helps when the patients take off the mask and you have leaks. We know that the patient with COVID, or, but also hypercapnic patients, they tend to be a little bit 
unstable from the psychiatric point of view and may uh, remove the mask. So I think uh, if if you can have that, that's uh, that's pretty good. And but that is almost like an ICU, to be fair. Yeah, and this is where we find that slip, don't we? And for intermediate care units, that intermediate care units come critical care quite quickly uh, with enthusiasm. Um, and, and that's exactly, uh, I, I agree with the points you're making. Um, I'd like to move on to Mohammed uh, and just what your experience and what you would say uh, the, the minimal requirements were. I think the most important is the clinical uh, uh, monitor the patient clinically and depends on where the patient is, whether they are in the ward or in the HD or in ICU. I think the, on the ward, uh, I think we can use the MUSE or uh, the early warning scoring system the, with SPO2. And usually um, we uh, the parameters like uh, the SPO2 of uh, 90 to 96%. But when the patient in the ICU, we... Um, same parameters, the PF ratio and SpO2, uh, plus the respiratory rate. And uh, it's good that if we can monitor the patient by uh, through the ABG and looking at the, the CO2, uh, the PaCO2, I mean, and also the uh, acidosis. Thank you. Yeah, Mohammed, I completely agree with you. And in fact, what I've written down here is, and sometimes we lose this as critical care respiratory folk, is that I'm also really interested in the temperature, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the urine output, um, because yeah. they are telling me about all the patient, what's going on. Um, and I think in COVID pneumonitis, uh, in particular, in the patients we're talking about, which were really carefully balanced in terms of their escalation of care, um, I think yeah. looking at their work of breathing, I, I really do think looking at how the patient is and um, and, and we went through that, and I've put it in the chat about the self-induced lung injury. But I, I agree with you, dividing up to the ward, the kind of level two HD and level three areas is, is really useful way to way to think think through. Um, can I go to you, Patrick, next, um, and just to say, uh, in your hospital in Thailand, what's what would you say the minimum requirements were? I agree with our. Uh speakers about the uh, respiratory rate and oxygenation and also i use the uh, respiratory pattern like uh including the red you have to make sure that if it is rapid or an uh shortness of breath i mean in terms of rapid breathing or deep breathing like kushmal breathing because it tells you about uh, the condition of the patient as well in terms of the respiratory patterns. I think that's absolutely right. And we go back to the point of the clinical examination of these patients is so important. And that links into the actual physiological measurements that we are making. And I think that's really clear. And I like that idea of um, I always feel if somebody, especially with COVID-19 pneumonitis, moves to a rapid, shallow breathing pattern, um, we've kind of missed the boat. And we actually should have been timely intubating folk before they got to that stage because they've hit crisis. They've got severe lung injury by that stage, as, as we all know. That's really helpful. And, and, and I, I think it's really great to see in the chat that along the lines of we're looking at work of breathing um, for these folk as well of, the, of our patients so we understand. Could I just then ask just to move on to this um, and it's really difficult because what I've just said is um, you go to a patient and examine their work of breathing which we've kind of touched on and I just wonder how you um, clinically assess that but also then how do you document it? Because we don't work 365 days a year. And I think work of breathing is one of those really kind of difficult things. And it'd just be really interesting um, to hear folks' view on how they look at work of breathing. Patrick, should we start with you as you're on the screen? Well, for breathing, absolutely. You can look at the patient and see the pattern of the respiration. But the point that I want to tell is the ultrasound. This side ultrasound is a non-invasive method that you can use to monitor the lung breathing, especially diaphragm thickness. Because if you compare the diaphragm thickness uh, during inspiration compared to the expiration phase, if it is more than 
thirty percent. This means that the patient has the work of breathing increase in terms of uh, if you if you use the setting of the mechanical ventilator, if the diaphragmatic thickening fraction above thirty percent, uh, there are more tendency the patient will have the uh, more difficult to beginning ventilator. If it is less than fifteen percent, maybe you support too much for the patients. And and do you do that in your routine clinical practice? I'm thinking we've got a large number of patients that come through our units and we've actually been running at over capacity and seriously over capacity. Do you have the opportunity to do that on a number or do you target patients who you feel um, that you feel you would like to know this data because you think they're going to deteriorate or they may not deteriorate? For COVID patients, uh, I agree with you, it's more difficult to access of the patient's best site. So in COVID patients, we tend to use ROX index it is more easy, easier compared to bedside exam. Yeah, and I think we'll all agree that rocks can be useful and, and actually looking at rocks and looking at deterioration pattern and, and what what actually changes first, the respiratory rate or the SpO2 is, I think, really interesting as well when you're breaking down the rocks. So that's great. Thank you for that. Um, Mohammed, can I ask you the same question when you're thinking about measuring um, respiratory effort uh, in terms of at the bedside, non-invasively, how how do you go about that? Uh, interesting questions. Um, at the bedside, uh, I don't have experience using uh, ATA sound, uh, but I use a lot of clinical experience and and the clinical parameters. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do use uh, ROS index when the patient is on the um, high flow nasal cannula, but uh, when patient is on the NIV, uh, I look at um, the most important parameters is the respiratory rate and also the. Um, the tidal volume uh, generated and uh, how much um, the, uh, in the ABG, uh, especially the PaCO2. So if that um, the patient uh, has high respiratory rate and the PaCO2 uh, and is still on the higher side, meaning that uh, there is high um, demand or the patients may be not um, coped with the, the demand of the disease. I think that's my my answer the the most important is the respiratory rate and the pf ratio yeah i i think you've hit clinical examination is just key here um and and yeah. that is actually the a really key element and again bringing that clinical examination yeah. into the physiological assessment uh, and we able to uh, identify um uh, the sick you know whether they are deteriorating or not I agree. And those folk who, or those patients we saw who had COVID pneumonitis, you know, I was struck by, in fact, the large tidal volumes they had, especially during the early stages when they were in a process early on within the inflammatory process after being admitted. And, And I think that was really key learning point is that somebody who has a high tidal volume um, who is breathing a lot, but looking relatively comfortable is actually not a good position to be in. And that's something, so yeah. somebody's put in the chat about rapid shallow breathing index. And obviously that's, you know, for patients who have already had significant changes in the compliance of their lungs. And so that's why they've adopted that pattern. Um, what we want to do is avoid people developing severe lung injury. Maxine, um, respiratory effort non-invasively, uh, any uh, advanced physiological techniques or, or is it just down to really good clinical acumen? I think it's uh, one of the difficulties that has been highlighted is the fact that uh, there's lots of patients. So uh, obviously, and you may be familiar with the technique, we we can use some uh, electromyography from the from the parasternal muscles to assess the work of breathing. And I think that is probably something that is quite useful also to see the impact that NIV or high flow may have on the patient. But what is challenging is it's difficult to use in clinical practice unless we have some uh, automatic tool to do the analysis. And uh, to, to add a little bit to the discussion, I think what is quite helpful is also to try uh, to do something to the patient. So I was quite uh, struck by the fact when, when you are doing prone positioning with the patient when he's awake, 
uh, you don't have to wait a lot of time to see that there is a change. And if there is a change, that means that uh, probably you can do better. And it's the same with CPAP. You can put the patient on CPAP quite rapidly, give it a try for 10 minutes, and you will see that the SAT is, is going up quite rapidly and the patient is breathing more comfortably. So I think if you have time, sometimes give it a bit of try on prone positioning and CPAP is quite helpful to assess indirectly if the patient are, has a lot of work of breathing or not. So I think that's absolutely right, isn't it? So, you know, there's there's the um, the actual assessment of the patient. There's the physiological measurement. There's the intervention that we perform, and there's the response to the intervention. And it's that response to the intervention. But for us not to get too sidetracked, if we put someone on CPAP and their Sats remain at ninety. 90 to 92 and we think oh great we fixed it they're actually the patients i'm more worried about <laughs> it's the ones that actually settle down and look better uh, overall I, I agree with you with that fahim um what's your thoughts on this respiratory effort of patients and how do we how do we get some uh standardization of the way we approach this it's quite difficult prof because when you see the variety of uh, because when you read a respiratory pattern per se clinically and we have variety of patients from skinny patient to obese patients and trying to get the uh, right picture sometimes is uh it's hit and miss sometimes we feel clinically on the ground basically uh, yeah so and personally I... uh examining the patient you said taking the multiple factors in play uh, you're even including a urine output. And when you see the patient the bedside yourself and the experience you have or combined we have over the years, that gives you more nuance to get the feel of it, basically. And we have been using low, okay, in my unit now over the years of experience of 18 months, low threshold to put people on NIV COVID pneumonia more than 24, 48 hours. We tend to go off to straight away to intubation because we realize it's when they induce lung injuries or problems and can't control the tidal volume they generate, uh, how much they generate onto. I think absolutely spot on, and, and that's what we learned in our centre with COVID pneumonitis. It meant that we had a uh, significant number of invasively ventilated patients, but in fact, um, it was reflected in terms of our survival outcomes as well, um, but puts a huge pressure uh, on, on the system. Um, and we mustn't forget within all of this, everything we're doing with COVID pneumonitis is underpinned by the drugs that are actually reducing the inflammation. Uh, and whether we use, you know, tocilizumab, dexamethasone and, and these combined therapies with uh, anticoagulation, hyd you know, adequate hydration rather than overhydration, it, these are all key elements to actually improving the outcome of our patients. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers i've really enjoyed this it's brilliant um in in terms of the spread of knowledge from around the world to have this discussion but it's interesting how similar the approach is and i think that is really key that standardization of approach that we're seeing which will improve patient outcome and so I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us. I'd like to obviously thank the audience um, for listening in. On behalf of Philips, on behalf of all the presenters who were brilliant and excellent and really gave a real life feel of what's going on, but also gave us some great insights um, and to really think about the balance between infection prevention control and the availability of full critical care beds, which is where we've ended up with the intermediate care respiratory care units. But thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>